So it is a pleasure now to kick off our day with a thought-provoking keynote address. He's our esteemed speaker, Cesar Hidalgo, who is a Chilean Spanish American scholar known for his contributions to economic complexity, data visualization, and applied artificial intelligence. He leads the Center for Collective Learning at the Artificial and Natural Intelligence Institute at the University of Toulouse and the Corvinus Institute for Advanced Studies at Corvinus University of Budapest. Let's get ready to explore a fascinating world of AI and its economic implications. Please welcome Cesar Hidalgo. Thanks everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And what I want to do today is to ask you guys a question, you know, which is, how is it that humans judge machines? It seems like a simple question, but in reality it's quite profound because it's not a question about machines or a question about technology, but it's a question about us. How do we judge each other? And how do we judge each other when some of us are different? This is an old question, and it's a question that tells us a lot about our psychology, about our morality, and about sometimes how we react, even if we do not know why we react the way that we do. So like this picture shows, it's not a question about the machine, but it's about how we project ourselves while we look at the machine. But as a scientist, I wanted to explore this question not through ramblings or not just simply by using rhetoric, but I wanted to have data. So what we did is a bunch of years ago now, it seems like the prehistory of AI because it was around 2018, 2019, with a group of psychologists and roboticists, we did over 80 experiments in which we tried to understand how people reacted to artificial intelligence compared to how they reacted to a human that would have done the same. So we recruited over 6,000 Americans that participated in these experiments and they were randomly assigned to a scenario that was presented to them as the action of a machine or that was presented to them as the action of a human. And the question that we ask ourselves is that, do they get the same reaction if they observe that scenario as the action of a machine or the action of a human? And if they get a different reaction, why do they get a different reaction? Could we try to understand what aspects of our psychology are making us judge people and machines differently. So I'm gonna start with the simplest scenario that I'm gonna use just to try to illustrate the methodology. And these scenarios are not easy to construct and they were harder to construct back then because they have to be scenarios that are plausible as the actions of a machine or a human. They have to be believable. This is an example of an excavator that is digging up a site for a new building and unbeknownst to the driver, the site contains a grave. The driver does not notice the grave and later drinks through it finding human remains. Now this could have been an autonomous excavator or this could have been an excavator operated by a human. And we ask people to react to that scenario uh, asking questions such as, was the action harmful? Or do you like this driver? Do you think this action was intentional? Was it morally wrong? And so forth. And we recorded answers for machines and for humans for all of these questions uh, so that we could compare how people reacted to machines compared to how they reacted to humans. So going forward, every time you see red on a chart, you're gonna see the reactions that people had when a scenario was presented to them as the action of a machine. I think red is for robots, you know, so you can remember it easily. And blue is how people reacted to that scenario when it was presented to them as the action of a human. And even this simple and trivial scenario, you see that there are differences. For example, people find the action of the machine as more harmful or people think that the action of the machine is more morally wrong, even though the action is exactly the same. So there's something that is changing, not based on what was done, but based on who did it. What could that be? In addition to getting people's reaction to these scenarios, what we did was also try to understand which moral dimensions were associated to each one of these scenarios. And to do that, we ran a word association type of study in which each scenario is presented together with a set of words, like the ones that you see here under each one of these titles, and we ask people to associate the scenario to each one of these words. And this allows us to know which moral dimension this scenario triggers. Because morality is not just about right or wrong, but about right or wrong in different dimensions. You know, sometimes there are things that are right or wrong that involve physical harm 
or breaches of loyalty or situations that are unfair or situations that involve something that we believe that is pure or sacred. In the case of this scenario, that association tells us that this is a scenario about purity. When you dig up a grave, nobody's hurt. You know? But if you would have dug up an old refrigerator, there would have been nothing wrong. There's something sacred about the human body, whether you are religious or not, and that is what this scenario triggers. So it involves that moral dimension, and that allows us to track the moral dimension that is being triggered by each one of these scenarios. So we have the people's reactions, we have the moral dimensions that the scenarios trigger, so now that we understand our methodology, we can try to look a little bit at scenarios that are a bit more sophisticated. So consider this emergency response scenario. There's a large tsunami that is approaching a coastal town of you know, 10,000 people and has potentially devastating consequences. There is an algorithm or a politician that is in charge of the safety of the people in that town and they can try to save everyone, but they could fail. It's not something that can be guaranteed, or they can take a compromise and just evacuate 50% of the people without any risk. So there's three possible outcomes, and that means that basically we had six groups of people. Yes? Two conditions, you know, three outcomes that reacted to this scenario that involves physical harm and fairness. You can have the unlucky scenario. The politician or algorithm tries to save everyone and fails. A large number of people die. Or the politician or the algorithm could try to save everyone and succeed. Everyone is safe. Great. Or they can take the compromise. So how did people react? Let's start with the compromise, which is going to be on the right-hand side of your screen. So if you look at the compromise, for the most part, there are no big differences. If you look at the harm question or you look at the like question, people like the machine that took the compromise as much as they like the human that took the compromise. The only big difference, which is highlighted there with that red square, is that people want to replace the machine that took the compromise with a human, but wouldn't want to replace the human that took the compromise with a machine. Now that question of replacing by the different kind is one in which machines usually lose by a landslide. So we're not going to read too much into this because actually there are going to be bigger differences in the other situations. Now let's look at the lucky scenario. This is a scenario in which actually the machine or the human did something great. They tried to save everyone and succeeded. It was a huge success. And what we find is that the human is getting much more credit. You know, people want to hire you know, the human that took the risk and succeeded more than they would want to hire the machine that made that same decision. They find the action of the human to be much more intentional. That might seem obvious right now, but trust me, it's not going to be as we dig along into more scenarios. They report liking the human more. They find the action of the human to be more morally correct, even though the action, of course, is exactly the same. So we're seeing that the human is getting much more credit than the machine, even though they did the same thing. But the biggest difference are going to be on the unlucky scenario, when you try to save everyone and fail. Here, there are large differences. The attitudes that people have towards the machine that tried to save everyone and failed, and the human that tried to save everyone and failed, are quite different. They find the action of the machine to be more harmful, they want to hire the human that tried and failed. They don't want to hire the machine that tried and failed. They find the action of the machine that tried and failed to be morally incorrect compared to that of the human that tried and failed. You know, they like the human that tried and failed. They dislike the machine that tried and failed. So for the most part, we're seeing big differences. And this scenario illustrates something that then we're going to be able to generalize as we look at more and more scenarios, which is that the human is being judged by trying. The machine is being judged by failing. So the human is being judged more for the intention, for the what they're trying to achieve, and whether they achieve it or not, it's okay, because the intention is what is being judged. The machine is being judged by the outcome, whether the machine was trying to achieve a good outcome or not. And intention is really important when it comes to moral judgment. So consider like this, toy scenario in which you have Alice and Bob, which are two colleagues at work, you know, that are competing for a promotion and they go out for lunch. Alice has a severe peanut butter allergy. You know, Bob doesn't know about it. She brings her a peanut butter sandwich. She takes a bite. She gets a strong allergic reaction and she has to be taken to the hospital. So in that scenario, there's no intention to produce harm, but there's harm. Yes, she got a reaction. She ended up in the hospital. 
And in that case, most people would agree that Bob was not at fault. He didn't know. He didn't have the intention to produce harm, even though he did it. Now, take the opposite situation in which Alice and Bob are the same colleagues at work, but Bob maliciously and knowingly that Alice has a peanut butter allergy, puts a spoon full of peanut butter into her soup. When Alice goes to get her soup at the refrigerator at work, she drops it, so she decides to go and get something else. She suffers no harm, but Bob was not right, yeah? Because intentions matter a lot. So what we're gonna be able to do as we continue to explore these scenarios is to build a mathematical representation of you know, moral judgment that is gonna incorporate multiple dimensions intention, harm, fairness, the characteristics of the people or the machines involved in these scenarios. And we're gonna be able to use this to try to generalize how people judge machines and humans. Now, can we talk about intention in machines? It sounds a little bit ridiculous, and trust me, when I started doing this work, I thought it was a little bit ridiculous myself too. But as I started to see the answers that we got, you know, I started to realize that intention and agency, of course, are much more complicated than sometimes we like to think. You know? Sure, a rock has no intention, and an adult human you know, is a moral agent that is responsible for their actions. But when we talk about intention, we have to differentiate between things. There are goals, and there are the ways in which we figure out how to achieve those goals. And machines with the ability to learn, AI, you know, are given goals, and they figure out how to achieve those goals through those learning algorithms by basically adjusting those weights if we're using a neural network in this example. So think of a car that is designed to protect pedestrians at all costs or designed to protect the driver at all costs. You know, in an uncertain situation, that car might behave differently. And even though it's not behaving with an intention, it's not deciding on the goal, it's behaving as intended. Because there is some agency not only on what you're trying to achieve, but maybe on the solution that you find to try to achieve it. Intention actually is a continuum, and there's this 2007 paper in Science by Heather Gray and others, in which they try to estimate the mental models that people have of humans, machines, babies, a lot of other entities, and they discover that there's a, a good model of the mind that can be expressed in terms of agency, the ability to do, to act, you know, and experience the ability to feel, to feel hunger, to feel pain, to feel sadness, to feel happiness, you know? And machines, are not judged as unable to have both. They're judged as unable to feel, but they're not judged as incapable because they do have capacity to plan, to memorize, to act, and sometimes to decide how to achieve a goal that was you know, given externally to them. Maybe in the future even to set goals themselves. So they're in this intermediate level of agency you know, that actually it's quite important and it's gonna have consequences. And we can see some of those consequences by looking at you know, a self-driving car scenario. So imagine that in a sunny spring day, there is a driver or driverless car working for a supermarket chain that accidentally runs over a pedestrian that runs in front of the vehicle. So the car is not at fault here, not the driver, not the self-driving car, it's the pedestrian, the one that runs in front of the vehicle. You know, the pedestrian is hurt and is taken to the hospital. So this is a scenario involving physical harm. And when we look at this scenario, we find once again that the machine is not being judged very nicely. You know, people think that the situation is such that when a self-driving car is involved in this accident, there was more harm, you know? They also find, you know, the action, you know, they, they like less the self-driving car that was involved than the driver that was involved in this accident, you know? But when we look at the intention dimension, we see that the roles are reversed now. It's not that the machine is giving a lot of intention, but the human is fully excused and the machine is not fully excused. There is this residual intention that is kept, you know, when we're judging a machine that is exonerated when we judge a human. And we repeated this scenario a number of times. We change, you know, the victim from a human to a dog. You know, we change what caused the accident from, you know, a, a pedestrian jumping in front of the car to a tree falling and causing the, the self-driving car to swerve. And in all cases, we find that people associate in this case more intention, a residual of intention to the machine. There's something that the machine could have done but not the human, the human gets completely excused. There are more scenarios that we looked at, some that involve, for example, PR. These are real examples of advertisement that were controversial. The one on top from the UK, for instance, you know, was removed after a few days, but actually did run on buses. And now that we have generative AI, we can ask ourselves the question, well, what if these ads 
were generated by a generative AI or were generated by a team of uh, publicists. And what we find here is that we don't see a lot of difference in a lot of dimensions, but there's a couple of them down on the bottom of your chart, we're gonna see a big difference. And this is a difference in the allocation of responsibility. So imagine that you have these lewd ads generated by a machine or generated by a team, and we ask people who's responsible you know, for these ads. And we ask whether the people on the top of the organization are the ones that are responsible and need to respond to the public, are the ones that actually should be accountable for this decision. And when you have a team of humans generating the ad, publicists you know, or a PR team, basically they act as a firewall for responsibility and that responsibility doesn't go all the way to the top of the chain of command. But when you start using machines, what happens is that now people associate you know, that action to the organization, to the top of the organization, and therefore they assign that responsibility to the top. So using AI is not just something that helps change the location of tasks, but also helps change the location of responsibilities. People at the top of the chain of command are gonna be held more accountable for mistakes that involve the use of artificial intelligence. Now there's a question that I think I need to get out, you know, which is maybe all of this is unnecessary because the only thing that I'm discovering here with my team is that people just don't like machines. You know, so far machines haven't been doing very well. People don't like the machines that try to save people you know, in an emergency response situation. They don't like the self-driving cars that get involved in an accident. They don't like the machines that much that, that, that do loot advertising. So maybe there's nothing to this. You know, it's just people like people and people don't like machines and that there's all that it is. So I have to find a scenario that contradicts that to show you that it's not that people only like people and dislike machines, and that's all that is going on here. And there's a scenario that I actually borrow from Jonathan Haidt's work, you know, that involves a family that has a cleaner, but also in our case could have a robot that has to clean their house. And one day this cleaner or this robot finds an, let's say an American flag, uses it to clean the bathroom floor and throws it away. So it's a different scenario from the one that we have seen before, because it involves something that is also quite symbolic and more complex to understand, like, you know, the meaning of a flag. This is a scenario that involves loyalty, authority, and also a sense of purity. And it's a scenario in which the machine is judged better than the human. People dislike the human that uses a national flag to clean the bathroom floor more than they dislike the machine that did the same people find the action of the human to be more morally incorrect than that of the machine. So it cannot be that it is just people liking people and people disliking machines, because we can flip some important dimensions in some of these scenarios. So the book is organized in such a way in which at the beginning, you know, I have you know, some of the scenarios that I showed and others to illustrate the methodology, to bring some important concepts of moral philosophy and moral psychology, and then it's organized in topics, you know, hot topics in artificial intelligence and the responsible use of artificial intelligence, such as algorithmic bias, you know, such as you know, automation and privacy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, fairness and algorithmic bias, because this is really a difficult problem. And it's a problem that we have learned that is very difficult because we have tried to make machines that make better decisions. And the reason why this is difficult is because there are some impossibility theorems involved here. So imagine that you have you know, a Taylor Swift concert that a lot of people wanna to go to, but some people are fans, some people are not fans, and people also differ on their characteristics. Maybe some of the fans are men, some of the fans are women. You know, they have some sort of label that you could assign you know, to differentiate the population. It's not just people. You know? And to make sure that the distribution of those tickets is fair, if you're giving them randomly, let's say in a, in a radio station or, or through some contest, you know, and it's also difficult to measure who is a bigger fan, you know, which would be you know, something that is, is reasonable to expect either. There's many ways in which we can try to define fairness. You know? Maybe the probability that a man that is a fan gets a ticket has to be equal to the probability that a woman that is a fan gets a ticket. And we can say that the distribution is fair when we achieve that equality. But maybe we can, Think of equality as the number of people that got ticket from each one of these categories. 
or even the probability of being falsely given a ticket if you were not a fan and you belong to a certain category. There are actually you know, dozens of ways to define fairness, and the problem is that there is a theorem that tells you that you cannot satisfy all of them simultaneously. There is an impossibility theorem, so if you maximize one form of fairness, you are immediately going to be not of the optimal in other forms of fairness. In our case, you know, we're interested in how people react to situations that are perceived to be unfair or that are perceived to increase fairness. So it's not just about Taylor Swift tickets. You know, there are many situations in which they supply, you know, college admissions, advanced parole systems, you know, or human resources screen. For instance, here you have a human resource system or person that is trying you know, to screen candidates for job interviews. There is an unfair treatment in which minority applicants you know, are discriminated against. And there's a fair treatment in which the new system, the new manager, or the new algorithm actually improves the fairness of the system for these minority applicants. You know? And we can apply this to college admissions, policing, salary increases, whatnot. But the results are going to be the same, so I'm just going to illustrate with one of them. So on the one hand, when we look at the harm dimension on the top, you know, we do see that in some cases, for instance, when the discriminated person in this example is of Hispanic or African-American origin, people see more harm in the human that did the discrimination than the machine that did the same. They're not thrilled about the machine. The, you know, the judgment is bad in both cases, but we do see uh, a slightly statistically significant difference. You know? But for the most part, many dimensions are quite similar. You know, the differences are not as large in many of these dimensions as the ones that we saw before in dimensions such as whether you like the machine or you like you know, this human resource person or you know, whether you would promote it or you find the action was morally correct or not. When we look at the fair treatment, you know, here we see that there's a big difference in intentionality. People think that the human that is improving the fairness of the process is doing it because that's the purpose of what they're trying to achieve, not for the machine. The machine is that intermediate, like meh type of state. You know? But also there's no big difference. Like here the human is not getting much more credit. They're not getting liked more. They're not thought about doing something more morally correct or whatnot. So I want to highlight two things you know, about this chapter. The first one is that when I compare the unfair treatment and the fair treatment, what I see is that people are more likely to want to replace a machine that got it right for a human than a human that got it wrong for a machine. So there's a very strong machine aversion at play here. You know? Imagine this is a machine that got it right, that made you know, a human resource screening process more fair and people still want to replace that machine with a human more than they want to replace a human that was proven to be unfair. Okay, so there's a very strong machine aversion here, even though there's not that much different in other dimensions of the judgment. But also, we find that for the most part, there are very small differences in many key dimensions. And this is actually consistent with US law. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act you know, declared that any act of discrimination across to these protected categories you know, was illegal, and that was ratified unanimously in 1971 by a Supreme Court ruling that says that these acts of discrimination are independent of intent. You know? So even though we see big difference in the intention dimension here, the judgment remains the same because it's not whether you were intended to discriminate, but whether you did. You know? And what we find in our study is in agreement with what the Supreme Court decided on 1971. Now, I'm gonna skip the chapter on privacy, you know, for time's sake, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about automation. You know, this is another hot topic, you know? And automation is important, has been a hot topic in AI throughout all of its waves. In the 1950s was a hot topic that came and went away, you know? And today, it has become a hot topic too, in part because there have been some doomsday scenarios in which people are losing their jobs to the machines in droves. You know, and what we decided to do is to test some of those scenarios. But in this case, we had to compare humans and machines. So we decided to compare you know, machines with humans that come from an outside group or that could be considered to belong to an outside group. So Coursera Tracking Company is, low, is looking to lower their costs and they, desire, they decide to bring in autonomous trucks or foreign drivers. You know, this reduces the cost of the company, but local drivers lose their jobs. So what would people prefer? Do they prefer autonomous trucks or foreign drivers? You know? And what we find here is that for the most part in this scenario, like people prefer the technology. They approve much more you know, of a change in technology 
than bringing foreign drivers for those jobs. They would like to ban the foreign drivers much more than they want to ban the autonomous trucks. You know? They find you know, that bringing foreign drivers in is less morally correct than bringing autonomous vehicles. The opinion of the company becomes worse if they bring foreign drivers than if they change their trucks for autonomous trucks. So this is another case in which now, you know, the machine is being judged better than the human. But truck driving is one of many, many industries. So what happens if we consider another company, for instance, another sector, like a nuclear power plant? Same dilemma, but now they're thinking about using an AI system to control the plant or, you know, bring foreign technicians to work at the plant. And in this case, we find a similar result, but very, very much reduced, ameliorated. You know, the differences are quite small, and this might be telling us that maybe people are willing to accept the foreigners as much as they're willing to accept changes in technology when this involves more complex, more high-tech sectors. Now, we also can do this using jobs that do not require people to be present at a location. So consider a hospital that is looking to lower their X-ray diagnostic cost, and you know, uh, they use you know, a computer vision system or some teams to actually you know, make this diagnosis for them. So it could be you know, opening a branch in a low-income country, that would be offshoring, or it could involve hiring a foreign contractor, that would be outsourcing, bringing foreign workers with temporary visas, or replace older workers with younger workers and you know, an AI system that would do the computer vision for them. When we look at that, we see something similar than what we saw in the tracker scenario. But we find that, for instance, people do not feel that bad about offshoring compared to you know, bringing in foreigners or replacing older workers by younger workers. You know? So there is a gradient. And depending on which this outside group is, you know, uh, we get a judgment that is more similar to the one that we find for technology. Offshoring, people in the same company, in the same group, but in a different location is the one that tends to be matched you know, with the change in technology. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna now try to go away from individual scenarios and I'm gonna try to look at all of them together using some statistics. I'm gonna go into that math that I promised you earlier on this presentation. You know, so I said that I could develop a mathematical representation with the data that we have that could help us understand how people judge machines and humans and maybe generalize some of those judgments into principles. I'm gonna start with descriptive statistics. I like this because I'm not gonna be making any assumptions about distributions or errors or statistical models. And then I'm gonna develop a statistical models to try to understand the differences between the way people judge machines and humans and how different attributes of the people that were involved in judging these scenarios affect those judgments. So the descriptive statistics are quite simple. You now we're gonna take harm, intention, and wrongness. You know, these three dimensions are the ones that are gonna be our main focus. And each scenario is gonna be represented by two dots. One showing how that scenario was judged when we presented it to people as the action of a human, and another one that's gonna show you how that scenario was judged when we presented it to them as the action of a machine. And we're gonna connect those two dots with a line so you know which machine scenario corresponds to which human scenario. And when we put all of them on a chart, we see this beautiful 3D picture, now, and we see that most of the dots fall along some diagonal or some plane. You know? And this is interesting, but it's also quite obvious. And this is because there are some forbidden corners in this moral space. You know, there's no way that something that is done with a lot of intention and that causes a lot of harm is judged to be good. That's gonna judge to be bad. You know? So that corner cannot be populated. You know? But there's also quite a lot of scatter. So we can look at the faces of this cube. For example, when we look at the intention and harm you know, face of the cube, we see something quite interesting. On the top of the chart, we see that the blue dots corresponding to the way in which people judge humans are above the respected red dots. So people attribute a lot of intention to humans when there are situations in which we can attribute intention to humans and excuse machines relative to them. But on the bottom of the chart, we see the opposite. The blue dots are below the red dots. So what this tells us is that we have kind of like these different modes of judgment we're judging humans using a bimodal distribution. You're either at fault or you're an excuse. You're either to blame or you're forgiven. The machines, you know, are judging this unimodal distribution. 
You know, that's a very strong empirical difference. Now, when we look at wrongness and intention, we see that intention is an amplifier of moral judgment. When intention is low, moral judgments tend to be bounded. They're not too bad or too good. You know, when intention is large, you know, we see that the moral judgment amplifies you know, and tends to correlate you know, with you know, the fact that because humans are giving or attributed more intention, they're judged as doing something better when they're doing something good or something worse when they're doing something bad. But when we look at low levels of intention, the red dots are above the blue dots. You know, what that is telling us is that basically in scenarios that are accidental, the machine is being judged worse than the human. You know? And finally, when we look at harm and wrongness, you know, there's a strong correlation between harm and wrongness, but you know, at low levels of harm, we see that people see the actions of machines as worse, even though you know, the level of harm attributed to them is quite similar. You see that the lines are vertical. You know, they're not slanted. You know? So now we can try to put all of this together in a mathematical model that allows us to go beyond these dots. These dots represented averages. Now we're going to go away from the average. We're going to use each one of these thousands of observations that we have to construct two moral functions. You know, these moral functions, what they're going to do is they're going to try to associate wrongness you know, with intention and harm. And we're going to do a function for humans and a function for machines. And this function is going to be quite simple, but still they're going to have a functional form that as we're going to see you know, is going to help us unpack things quite interesting. So we're going to say that wrongness is a function of harm plus intention plus an interaction term between intention and harm. And then we want to have fixed effects. What do these fixed effects mean? It's a little bit technical, but for the statisticians in the room, they know very well that fixed effects are a way to control for all individual characteristics that are constant among the respondents. You know? So they have differences in age, they're accounted for. Differences in shoe size, they're accounted for. Differences you know, in their gender or in their sex, they're accounted for. Differences in the race, they're accounted for because every individual in the sample is given a unique vector that is able to capture that. So by taking away the effect of the individuals, we can only keep the effects of you know, the differences between the scenarios. And then we're going to do the opposite. We're going to put fixed effects for the scenarios, and we're going to look at the differences among individuals. When we do these functions, you know, if you want to get the full functional form, you can get the book. But here, you know, what you can see is that these planes are not parallel to each other. So we're confirming this idea that it's not that people just like people and hate machines. Because if that would be the case, the red plane showing how people judge machines would be parallel to the plane you know, that is blue and that is showing you how people judge humans. And there would just be kind of like some difference or gap between them. But these planes intersect. They're quite similar you know, when you look at high harm and high intention. And they're very different there on the back. You see this big gap on the back you know, where the red plane is way above the blue plane? That's a scenario that have a lot of harm and very little intention. So in these really bad accidents, we observe this large gap. And this gap is a statistically huge. It's 0 0.2 points in a variable that goes between 0 and 1. You know? So it's a huge gap. You know? And what this gap is telling you is that maybe the way in which we're judging humans and machines is described a different functional form. You know? The blue plane has a curvature that the red plane doesn't have. Because what is happening is that for the red plane, Basically, when people judge a machine in, in one of these 80 plus scenarios, the only thing that they do is they see the outcome and they associate that outcome to some level you know, of moral wrongness. And they only care about the harm dimension, therefore. The intention dimension is more or less being ignored. But when people are judging humans, they're using the blue plane. And in this blue plane, we have this curvature because what really matters there is this interaction term between intention and harm. And that gives this plane this curvature and that makes the judgment that we have of humans and machines more similar at high levels of harm and intention and very different for these bad accidents in which you know, intention is low but harm is high. And now we're going to do the opposite exercise. We're going to look at how the demographic characteristics of the respondents you know, affect their judgment. Now, I know that this can be a controversial topic, but I want to just mention one thing which is really important, which is that when you look at the x-axis here and you look at those numbers, these are very small effects. These are statistically significant, but they're much smaller than the effects that we saw before. Before we saw an effect that was 0.2. Now we're going to look at effects that are 0.05, 0.01. You 
You know? So what this means is that most of the variation that we're serving at data is between the scenarios. But there's a small variation, like you know, what would be playing a harmonic over you know, like a fundamental note in music, like a smaller variation you know, that actually can be attributed to the demographic characteristics of the respondents. You know? So they're not going to change you know, the system or what we've served, but they're going to alter it a little bit. They're going to move it a little bit. For instance, on the top, you know, we had asked people if they consider themselves religious or not without asking about any denomination. And what we find, for instance, is that religious people tend to be more, let's say, pro-human. You know, if you ask them to replace a machine for a human, they don't do it as much as people that are not self-identified as religious you know, uh, in comparison. When we look at the gender dimension on the bottom, we find that actually, you know, men, we tend to be a little bit more machinophilic. We want to replace humans by machines more than women, and women, you know, actually want to replace more, you know, machines by human, you know? And these are differences that we find, and they're consistent, and the significance is there, but they're small, meaning that, you know, they do not change what we saw before, they add just a little bit of variation over the planes that we just saw. So I started this presentation by asking if a machine and a human make the same mistake. Do they get the same reaction? I hope I convince you that they don't. We do react differently to the scenarios involving humans and machines. There's only one thing that I haven't done, which is explain why. How would we judge a machine that we perceive more similar to a human, more similar to the way that we judge a human? Or do we have like different modes of judgment, reserved for humans and reserved for machines? So in a more recent paper, we tried to answer that question. Why do people judge humans and machines differently? And we basically ask ourselves whether people would judge a machine that is perceived more human-like differently than a machine that is perceived very machine-like. And to do that, we need to expand our experimental setup. So instead of having humans and machines, you know, which means that we're averaging over all of the perceptions that people have of machines, we had four machine conditions. And these machine conditions were manipulated to make these machines more similar to humans in a mental model than uh, or not. So how we, do we do this? We borrow this uh, mental model um, of Gray et al. You know, that defines dimensions of perception of, of other people's minds in terms of agency and experience. And we know where the machine lies, we know where the human lies, but we want to try to do, we want to try to create conditions in which we manipulate people to believe that the machine that they're judging is a machine that has a higher level of agency or a higher ability to feel than you know, the ones that would be in other scenarios. So now we separate people into five different groups. We have you know, a, a larger set you know, of conditions. And the way that we manipulate this perception is quite simple. You know, we present people with different texts describing the machine. So for example, we can say that Alice is an advanced robot able to plan, remember, and compare and just by putting that advanced robot and able words there, we're communicating that this is a robot that would have more agency than if we would have said, Alice is a robot that is unable to plan, remember, and compare, and so forth. You know? Some scientists believe that given Alice advanced artificial intelligence, she's able to feel joy, pain. Or some scientists believe that given Alice's primitive artificial intelligence, she's unable to feel joy, pain, anger, and so forth. And then we run an experiment to see how people judge the mental model of these machines based on these different descriptions, and the manipulation works. You see that there's like four different now machine conditions. A plus means high agency, E plus means high levels of experience, A minus meaning low levels of agency, E minus meaning low levels of experience. And now, you know, we can use our moral functions to try to go at this again. And technically, you have to remember that what we were looking at before you know, are some derivatives. We're trying to look at how wrongness depends as a function of harm and how wrongness depends on intention. And because this functional form has an interaction term, we cannot just read that from the coefficients. You know, we have you know, these other linear forms in which intention matters for the judgment of harm and harm can matter for the judgment of intention. So we have to do a little bit of math, we expand that moral function, we group it, and eventually we estimate it. And when we estimated, we learned that only the perceived agency tends to affect our estimates. You know? And we can recover our moral functions, we can take our derivatives, 
And we can now see if people judge machines that are perceived to be more human-like, more similar to the way that they judge humans. So here on the y-axis, you have the effect of intention in the moral judgment of wrongness. Yeah? How much intention matters in the moral judgment? For high agency machines in red, or for low agency machines in blue, you know, as a function of the perceived level of harm of the scenario. We we'll find that across the board, when the machine is perceived to be of higher agency, people care more about the perceived intention when they're trying to assign wrongness. Yeah? So across the board here, they're perceiving the machine as more human-like, and they're judging it as more human-like. Now, when we do the other derivative, when we look at how harm affects wrongness, we have to focus here on the left side of the chart, because for the most part, for the machine scenarios, intention is very much skewed to the left. The median intention that was attributed to people in these scenarios is about like 0.2. And in that left side of the chart, we find that actually when the machines are perceived with higher agency, the role of harm is diminished in the judgment of wrongness compared to when the machines are perceived with low agency. The red line is below the blue line on the left of the chart where more scenarios lie. So we find that actually it's not that people judge humans and people judge machines and we just make a difference. We have like this continuous of mental models based on, in this case, agents and experience. We would have considered other mental models too. But, you know, when we move the machine closer to the human in the space of mental models, our judgment also moves along with it and we start judging, you know, the action of the machine more similar to how we would have judged the action of a human that would have done the same. You know, so now we can look at our planes again, and we see, for example, when agency is high there on the right, you know, the planes now start to coincide much more. That gap is not as big as when agency is low. So how do we judge machines? Well, in short, we judge humans by intentions and machines by their outcomes. This is not entirely and precisely correct. We actually judge humans by the interaction term between intentions and outcomes. You know, but if you want a bumper sticker version of the result, you know, this is the one that you want to get. You know? And we also judge the intentions of humans by modally and those of machines in a way that is more unimodally. And there's some corollaries for these principles. For example, people are more forgiving of humans in accidental situations. You know, when intention is low and harm is high, you know, people can forgive a human that made a big mistake you know, to err is human, but we don't forgive the machine that made a big mistake or that was involved in a situation that caused a lot of harm, even if it was not the fault of the machine, even if it was accidental. Now, people can be a little bit more judgy of humans in a scenario that involve fairness. We see that actually humans were judged a little bit more harshly than we judge machines in the algorithmic bias scenarios, but also in the scenarios that involve fairness, like those of labor displacement, people in that case tended kind of like to prefer you know, the machines over the humans in some of those cases. You know, people really do not like harm and violent scenarios that involve machines. You know, we have, I didn't show here, but in the book we have a number of scenarios. We have an appendix with also, you know, dozens of more scenarios. We have, for example, a scenario of a cop or, you know, a robocop involving an extrajudicial killing. People really don't want to, you know, uh, have situations like that that involve machines. There the judgment is really hard against the machine compared to the human. You know? And people can also take machine success for granted. You know, if the machine gets it right, that's what it was supposed to do. If the human gets it right, they deserve a promotion. But why do we judge human and machines differently? It's maybe because we perceive them differently. It's not that we just have different modes of judgments for human and machines. It's that we have a continuous of modes of judgment. You know? And these modern philosophies adjust as our perception changes. As we move towards a perception of machines that is more human-like, we judge also machines in a way that is more similar to the way that we judge humans. So the book is also available as online video course. If you teach you know, in a way that is remote or that involves some remote, you know, students can watch the videos, you can discuss them on the class. You know? The book is also available completely for free to download at judgingmachines.com, but if you want a physical copy, you know, you're gonna have to go through MIT Press. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time I'm happy to take any questions.
Yes. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So the question is then, how do we allocate responsibility to machines and humans when they're both involved in the creation of the machine? You know, and I didn't go through that. In chapter seven of the book, I explore kind of these more legal implications. And artificial intelligence is a very interesting technology in that its development involves multiple parts that usually do not come from the same individuals. So you can think you have the data, you have the hardware, you know, you have the algorithms. And it's hard to attribute, you know, differentially back, you know, the responsibility to each one of those parts. You know? And that's what makes, you know, the judgment of artificial intelligence much harder than what it makes the judgment of other type of consumer products, you know, for which we do have a product liability law in which we can associate that differential judgment. Yes? Thank you. Um, there's a literature on trust and overtrust in, in machines, and I'm wondering yeah. how that fits into your story. Um, so, for example, um, we had a colleague here, um, Ayanna Howard, who is a roboticist who uh, is, is no longer at Georgia Tech, but she did some studies where um, there were robots uh, helping people to exit from a building that was, you know, on, so supposedly on fire and what yeah. have you. And what she and her team found was that humans placed too much trust in robots. There would be situations where like there's an exit sign pointing this way and the robot would go the other way and the humans would still follow the robot, right? And other situations. So I'm wondering how um, this literature is suggesting that there is a tendency for humans to place too much trust in machines in certain situations fits into um, your story here. Yeah. No, that's a good question. And you do have examples like the ones that you mentioned, which in some sense, people follow the machine. You know, the machine is not expected to make a mistake or to fail. It's not expected to lie. You know, it's expected to have kind of like some sort of, you know, behavior that maybe was programmed with some sort of positive intention. At the same time, people tend to lose trust on machines very easily. So there's some experiments that were done by um, a scholar called Berkeley Didvorst at Chicago. And for instance, he has, you know, humans or machines become financial advisors of people in experiments in which people get a financial reward at the end of the experiment. So imagine you go to the lab, you know, and you get assigned to a treatment or a control group in which there's a robot advisor or there is a human advisor that is giving you tips of how to invest on this simulated stock game. You know? And you invest and then eventually you get a return based on whether you made good bets or not, whether you followed the human advisor or whether you followed the machine advisor. And what they find is that even though in this game, the machine advisor was better, they was providing better returns than the human advisor and the subjects could have served that, when they created a version of the experiment in which they showed the picks and they showed the mistakes, people tended to overinterpret the mistakes that the machine made, lose trust in the machine, and go to the human advisor, you know, even though that generated a slower return. Because when the human advisor made a bad pick, well, they made a mistake. When the machine made a bad pick, I, of course, would have never sold Tesla that quickly. You know, people would overinterpret, you know, like their ability to have not made the mistake that the machine made, they would lose trust and they would go back to the human. So I think this trust dynamics is interesting, you know, because trust, as we all know, it's hard to earn, you know, and easy to lose. You know, and when it comes to machines, we tend to lose trust on them very quickly, especially when we see them error, when they, when they don't become black boxes. And that's very interesting because there's a lot of work now on explainable AI, and some of the tacit assumptions there are that if we make AI more explainable, we're gonna trust it more. It could be that if we make it more explainable and the mistakes become more transparent, people might even trust it less. You know, psychology could go the other way. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. uh, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I have a two part question and the two parts are not related to each other. The first part is um, there is this company called Anthropic, um, which is a competitor of open AI. And their entire premise is that you can give a constitution to the AI as your 
training the AI so that it has values that mirror human and societal values. And my question is, do any of your results, um, how do you think people will, people's judgment of AI and machines will change if they know that the value system that was used to train the AIs are more aligned with their value system? And then the second part of the question is, have your results been independently verified by other researchers? I'm, I'm interested in whether they've been reproduced by other researchers. Thanks. Thank yeah, for the second question, it's, it's easy. Yes, there's now a lot of work on this space. When we started doing this in 2018, there wasn't that much work on this space, but now there is. And a lot of people have you know, found you know, very similar results in similar conditions. Of course, you can do a lot of variations of these experiments in which you change you know, the results, but usually there is a reason for that in some of the effects. For instance, a car accident that is not necessarily caused by a human jumping into the vehicle, but where the vehicle has some blame. You know? Now, on the other question about the constitution you know, solution to the alignment problem, you know, uh, I'm a little bit skeptic about that because I, I do believe that the fact that laws are written in such a way that it's not very precise and it's open to interpretation, I've come to believe that is a feature rather than a bug, you know, because I believe that morality is similar to, you know, Godel's incompleteness theorem in which we always, you know, can define a set of rules and we're always going to have things that are going to escape that set of rules that are going to force us to expand that set of rules. And that's why, you know, the way that we try to encode our morality into rules keeps on growing, keeps on expanding and becomes increasingly more complicated. So morality is very dynamic, you know, and morality, I think, that cannot be reduced to a set of mathematical objects. I understand that I use math here, but to provide an empirical description that we can use to look at differences in an experimental setting, not in an axiomatic way in which I think I can deduce morality based on a few principles from the bottom up. So I do think that it's interesting to, to try to generate alignment through this type of uh, alternatives, but my, and this is intuition and speculation, my intuition and speculation is that morality, it's open, it's incomplete in the same sense that mathematics is, and therefore, it can never be reduced to a finite set of rules. Yes? I have a question on human biases. So we yeah. know humans are naturally biased towards gender, race, or other human characteristics. So the question is, one, have you done anything related to when you put um, a machine with more female characteristics or male characteristics, those human judgments come out when dealing with the machine? That's a good question. We didn't run a scenarios in which we vary kind of like the, the anthropomorphized gender of the machine. You know, in part because every time we do a, a variation in the scenarios, we need to hire and get, you know, a larger number of subjects. So I, I don't have, you know, evidence on that. I know that there's a lot of people that do work on the fact that, for instance, you know, it is much more common for AI assistants to be presented as, you know, females than males, you know, um, but I wouldn't have much more to comment. Thanks. But it's a good question. Yes. The field of work that you're doing. Oh. The work that you're doing is uh, great in the sense that there's a lot of practical applications in the sense, I used to work in the insurance industry. So how does, um, particularly from like a medical robots or even like uh, self-driving cars and the attribution of blame, et cetera, um, have you worked with um, the industry to try and figure out how to, um, how this, entire thing fits into the insurance uh, side of the equation? I, I don't. It might be because I'm living in Europe now where insurance works quite different. You know, like, like I, I get state health insurance from France and, and, and I stopped thinking about some of those things as much as I did when I was thinking here. Uh, sorry, when I was living here, but I, I haven't worked closely with insurance providers to see how they would incorporate this. I'm sure there's a lot of smart people there that might have ideas on, on maybe how to take some of these ideas and incorporate them into the way that they price things or, or consider things. Thank you. Thank you.